Okay, well, it's good to be with you live this time. I apologize for the <laughs> several videos in previous sessions, but I, I did want to at least try to get some of those reviews to you guys, even though my schedule did not allow for me to um, be able to do it live with you. But now, hopefully, Lord willing, um, next few weeks and then uh, through most of November, we'll be able to to have these sessions live. I'll probably record a couple in October. What I'd like to do is, you know, we've focused attention on the Old Testament, the assignments for the Old Testament passage from Jonah or Ruth. What I want to do now is turn our attention and just go through an example from the Gospel of John. It's a text that's not assigned to anybody in the class, but I think at least uh, wanted to go through uh, an example from John with you guys over these next several weeks, uh, just in focusing attention on the New Testament passage. Because at this point in time, you know, some some of you are behind, but at this point in time, we need to be moving into that New Testament uh, passage and be finishing up the uh, the Ruth or Jonah assignments. But there's still time, as I was telling Brother Yancey, uh, there's still time uh, to catch up uh, if you're behind because we still almost have three months, a little less than three months uh, left, because there was a pretty long gap between Module 1 and Module 2, uh, or sorry, Module 2 and Module 3 in this case. Uh, so there's a little extra time for, for you to get to those assignments, and a little extra time for me to get to grading those assignments. But um, just want to encourage you, and then let the other brothers know that uh, even if you feel behind, don't, don't worry at this point if you can commit um to getting at least you know getting an assignment done for each week if you're way behind you should be able to catch up um pretty quickly so now's the time though to to apply ourselves to be more diligent like okay i'm gonna really work at trying to get an assignment done each each week and honestly speaking uh even getting it done if you're if you are caught up only having to do one assignment probably every two weeks and you'll be able to stay on pace. But uh, so, yeah, don't don't worry about it. If you feel behind, I've seen this time and time again. The guys that are behind, able to catch up when they uh, really are focused and are diligent, consistent, set time aside every week. That's the key. Just even uh, be able to set three or four hours each week aside on a particular day. That really you'll you'll get there you'll get caught up so um but that's the key is to discipline ourselves to get it in our schedules on a regular basis so uh i have found that that to be the best the best uh practical way to get stay on top of those assignments but with that like i said i wanted to uh turn our focus our attention to to looking at uh, an example from John, John chapter four, the known the story known as the woman at the well. Um, I think we're all pretty familiar with that story, so I that's why I thought it was one that came to mind that we could sort of use as uh, an example to go through together on approaching uh, studying a New Testament narrative. And since you guys are uh, were assigned a passage from the Gospel of John. I thought doing uh, an example from that same Gospel would be helpful. In fact, today I'm going to be giving you a lot of helpful information um, that you can use towards a couple of your assignments. Um, so I'll be actually giving you some answers or partial answers uh, to your assignments uh, today. So glad you're able to to join us or those of you who uh, those are the guys who weren't able to join us but are watching video. I, you're going to benefit from uh, taking that time to do that today because uh, I want to cover the, uh, we'll go through the first few steps uh, together for John. And in doing that, I'll give you some some uh, information, insights that you can apply to the, the first assignments. Uh, if you recall, this is our overview of the exegetical process. For interpreting narratives, the the study process, study study process, excuse me, and again we we'll take note of the first three steps, as you know, focusing attention on the book, book level. First step being to read and observe the whole book. So you're going to be um, first assignment 
for John, Gospel of John, which I believe is, let me confirm this, the assignment numbers, they're on Canvas, but assignment uh, 2.17 is the uh, Gospel of John, the read and observe assignment. You'll do the exact same thing you did for Jonah or Ruth, whichever book you had, except this time the challenge is uh, the book's a little bit longer than Jonah or Ruth. We're actually looking at the whole Gospel of John, so you're going to need to take a little bit of time reading through that Gospel uh, at least a few times. I encourage you to do that. That's part of the assignment. And then making the observations, just like you did for the Jonah or Ruth uh, books, uh, you'll make the general observations. In fact, why don't I just pull it up real quick, just by way of reminder for you guys. Um, let's see, here it is. Okay, so this is the uh, read and observe the Gospel of John. It's Stephen, it's very long, yes, it is. <laughs> um, but it's inspired text, so it's profitable for... Um, Profitable for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that we may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So, um, and two, honestly, guys, you know, the Gospel of John is is a familiar gospel, right? I think we're all pretty generally familiar with that book. So it's not it's not like you know I could have done Genesis, you know, Genesis or uh, First Kings or something like that. So, Gospel of John, it's also a great book to sort of have to preach through, especially if you're church plant, you know, if you're starting a, an outreach, um, it's a great book to start with. Since it's obviously focused on Christ, it's intended to be evangelistic uh, in its purpose. And, and all of the stories are really connected to that purpose in some way. And so, and there, you know, the, the more the miracles and, and actions of events in Christ's life that really aren't mentioned. Many of them aren't mentioned in the other gospels. So it's, it's a great book to, and that's one of the reasons I chose it for your assignment is I think you can use it then in your ministries um, in an effective way. So, so the time you're spending putting into studying this book now will really pay dividends, you know, be helpful to you in the ministry and for the people that you're ministering to. In fact, I know some of you probably have already preached from the book, uh, perhaps in previous ministries. So, so the Gospel of John is yes is long, but I did want us to to tackle that, that for our New Testament book. And so, here are the assignments, just like you did for Ruth or Jonah, uh, except this time you're going to read through the book of John several times. Indicate how many times, uh, maybe because of its length, even at least trying to do one time through a few different translations, and then maybe another time or two through your translation. Um, I would say at least you know four or five times going through the book so you can get familiar with it would be my recommendation. And again, you're going to do the same steps where you're going to make some specific observations that are listed here and just answering these questions in a basic way. And then some general observations. That's for each chapter. Make at least five observations. And, and one thing I want to again emphasize in making these general observations, these are not just going through and summarizing verses, saying this verse says this, this verse says this. No, the idea is just things that that you notice, things that stick out to you, things that seem interesting uh, or things that uh, seem important on uh, repetition, you know. You're, you're just observing things. So you're not just summarizing, you know, verses. Uh, this isn't an interpretive step as much as it's just an exploratory step, you're just exploring. And then coming up with at least, um, what did I say? Was it two questions there? Two questions each chapter. So only five observations, two questions. So I know that's not that many. I know there are a lot of chapters, but just uh, I would suggest, you know, read through the book couple of times and then um, as you read through it on the third or fourth time just read through a chapter make five observations two questions from that chapter read through the next one um, so this this assignment will take you uh, more more time than it did for Ruth or Jonah 
Um, so you need to keep that in mind as you prepare for it, all right? That's the read and observe, which again is the first step that we need to do for the book. Then the next step is discovering the background context of the book. And here's where I want, we'll spend a little time with John just in a sort of a higher level, but at least it'll give you some, some input, some uh, things you can use as you complete the assignment. Remember, background context of the book. Again, this will be the same thing that we did for Jonah or Ruth except for doing it for John now, is we're looking for more specific and detailed uh, understanding of these categories, all right? And in the they, they're going to be similar to what we saw for the making specific observations in the previous assignment, except here you're going to provide more detail. So for example, in the making observations assignment, you just put down the author, you know, uh, verse, whatever, indicates this might be the author. Um, but here you're going to give more information. What do we know about the author? Does the author refer to himself in the book? And in this book, in the Gospel of John, the author does refer to himself several times. He mentions uh, the one whom Jesus loved, the beloved brother, the beloved disciple, which uh, we'll find in John chapter 21. He mentions himself there. That he, he says, I am the one, we can take a, a look at it, right? And John, I forget the verse now. Oh, sorry, John 21. Uh, it's toward the end of the chapter. Yeah, no, it's verse 24. Um. This is the disciple who's bearing witness to these things. Which disciple is that? The one who is asking Jesus about the question regarding Peter. Which one is that? Peter saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following. So the disciple whom Jesus loved in the book of John, the gospel of John, is the author. So we want to note that. All right. Now there's a question as to who the author might be. And if you study this chapter carefully, chapter 21. Again, we see here the disciple whom Jesus loved is the author of the book, and he is mentioned earlier in the chapter as being among those who was fishing on the Sea of Galilee, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter as they're fishing on the Sea of Galilee. So the, the author is one of the disciples and he was present at this time in John 21, the Sea of Galilee, when they were fishing, and Jesus, uh, after the resurrection, came to them. So if you give a careful study of this chapter, you can, I think, identify the possibility of this being, uh, I think, four four guys. You can, you can narrow down the list to four possibilities from the book itself. All right? So I'll leave that to you. To go through here and do that, but uh, there are many clues here as to who the author might be, um, and then of course church history affirms uh, who that is, but we even see within the book, it points us to uh, a, just a few possibilities, that uh, it's definitely one of the disciples, it's the disciple whom Jesus loved, and so we just need to figure out, well, who is that? But he has mentioned several other places in the book, uh, in, in the gospel. He describes uh, himself. He was the one, remember, at the Last Supper, leaning on Jesus' uh, chest. Uh, in fact, the cross-references here have a few other references to him. Um, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, oh, this is John 21. Whoops, not the one I wanted. There it is. Uh, reclining on Jesus's chest was one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Okay, so all that to say is there's details within the book that identify that the author mentions himself in this particular case. Okay, so we want to keep that in mind. Um, the historical context is can we identify when the book was written and when the events in the book took place? 
Okay, remember, those are two different things. The social context is that is what people are mentioned in the book, but and also, what do we know about them? In the observations assignment, you just need to list the people mentioned. But in this, in the background context, you now need to indicate what do we know about those, those people. And uh, I know for a book as long as John, you know, there's going to be a lot of names. So you're just going to be selective, picking out a few. And then when you go and study that particular story as you're teaching through the book, that's you will give more attention to what do we know about the people mentioned there. But so but for this assignment, for the background context, just select a few key names that you see in the book and what do we know about them. Right. Otherwise, it would be much, much too long. It's the same for the geographical context. Um, in the when you make observations, you're just going to note. Um, the places mentioned here, you want to identify what do we know about those places? And again, just, just pick the, the prominent ones, the key ones um, that are mentioned in the book. And then the cultural context, what is the culture within the, 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 the people that are being addressed within the book? And then the occasion, that is what prompted the writing of the book? What caused the author to write the book, this gospel? What was the situation or circumstances that that motivated him to write? We're going to talk about that a little bit with John. All right. So these are what need to be covered when you're looking at the background context. OK, so let's do that for Gospel of John. Um, and as I said here, the author. Uh, we can determine John wrote it. hence the name, the Gospel of John. And there's two reasons. One is the internal witness of the book, and I already gave you some hints. So you're going to go to John chapter 21 and just read that carefully, especially the beginning. And you're going to see, like I said, it mentions several, seven, I think seven of the disciples are there, seven of the 11. And so specific names are mentioned. All of them are named, I think, except two. Um, but then as you go through, you'll be able to determine by studying carefully, reading J John 21 carefully, that there's only four that it could be. It can narrow it down to just four possibilities. Okay? So that's the internal witness of the book. It helps to show us John, as well as three others, are possibilities based on what's revealed in John 21. And then the external witness of the book, that is uh, resources outside of the Bible, affirm uh, John as the author. And that would just be something you would have to find from other resources, like a Bible encyclopedia or a commentary, introduction and commentary it would indicate early church fathers, even as early as Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who himself was a disciple of the, the apostle John. So Irenaeus indicates John wrote that gospel. And he likely... Uh, that's a very strong support because he was in direct contact with the disciple of Jesus of uh, John. Uh, so, so we have both the internal witness points us to four possibilities, and then John being one of those four, and then the external witness that is the early church fathers identified John as the, as the one. So we have pretty strong. We can be pretty confident that it was John who wrote it. But so in your background context, just go through John 21 a little bit and indicate from what you learned there, how John is, is a, is a strong candidate uh, for that. Okay. Any, any questions on that or anything I've talked about so far? I really want to encourage your own personal study in in this because we can go you know i can go over and grab you know grab one of my one of my bible encyclopedia uh books and look up john and, oh it's john and okay okay i'm done um we can do that that's okay as long as you use good resources or you can go to you know the macarthur commentary or you can go to carson's commentary on the gospel of john or you know and they, they, they'll tell you um, 
but I really hope that through this course, trying to help you guys see and equip you to get, you can get a lot of this yourself. Um, that if, like I said, John 21 clearly identifies and lays out who the author could be. And a lot of people don't even know that. They don't even think about that. But we, in our just our own study, if we put in the effort, we can learn a lot on our own. And the more you do yourself, the better you remember, the stronger your convictions. And even then, when you're preaching through the book, if you've done the study, things come to your mind. I think the Spirit brings to mind things that you have had studied and thought about. Whereas if you read it from somebody else, it's less likely that will be the case. Um, but I know, you know, there's time pressures situations and you know these resources can help be helpful for us in that way so i understand i don't i don't think it's wrong to use them at all we need to but i think the more you're able to do yourself um that that will really just make you much more effective in your understanding and even in your teaching of the passage so so i'm trying to encourage you to do a little bit more on your own in investigating these things now some books like you guys noted for Jonah or Ruth, we just don't have much about the author at all. So we're just kind of guessing. Um, and the author doesn't mention himself very much in either of those books, uh, you know, unless Jonah wrote Jonah, which I think he did. But uh, so sometimes we're just not given enough information from the book to know for sure. So I, in those cases, uh, you know, we can only get what we get. But in this case with John and many other books, there is, there is things that you can identify from within the book. So try to, to do that here on your own. All right. And as we look at uh, the background, we think about the recipients. Uh, let me ask Yancey to read this. Uh, this will be a key verse, uh, two verses within Gospel of John in identifying the John's purpose in writing, but also here we give an idea, have an idea of who he his audience is. So Nancy, if you could read the John twenty verses thirty and thirty one here. Yeah, um, John twenty verses thirty to thirty one. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but. These have been written so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing we may have life in his name. So notice we see here, uh, these have been written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing have life in his name. So John intended this book to be, uh, at least partly intended it to be evangelistic. And that he wanted to present signs Jesus performed in order that those reading may come to believe in the um, person of Christ and as a result of that faith have eternal life. All right. So we see here that unbelievers were in John's mind as far as an audience, but also he rec uh, we see two elements that John recognized his audience would also include Gentiles. And we see that by these parenthetical statements that he makes throughout the book, uh, where he gives a, a Aramaic word or a location um, and gives a translation in the Greek. You know, this is written originally in Greek. So like here, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And then he says, by the way, that that word means sent. Right. Or or here in John four, nine, he gives indication of a cultural issue between Jew and Samaritan. Now, the Jews would know this. All right. If you're Jewish or Samaritan reading the Gospel of John, you would know this. You wouldn't need this parenthetical statement. But if you're a Gentile, you may not know. that. Uh, so we see here John recognized the broader audience. Uh, through that. And there's other places where he did this. I just chose a couple by way of example uh, of that. Uh, John 1, there's several examples of where he gives a translation for a particular word like rabbi or, or messiah. Uh, so 
So that tells us that he recognizes his audience would include Gentiles um, in the uh, among among his readers. Okay, so you're going to want to take note of these things as you list uh, the the audience. Now the historical context. Now remember, there are two historical contexts we need to consider when we're talking about narratives. The first is when when does the story take place all right and then the second is when was the book written so you have the historical context of the author or sorry the historical context of the story and the historical context of the author just like in ruth or jonah right ruth was written in the days of the judges, right? It says that at the very beginning. I'm sorry. The story of Ruth was in the days of the judges, right? But it was written after that, at least in the days of David, if not after that. So it was written in the time of the kings, most likely during David's reign, but it was the events in the story were took place in the times of the judges probably the latter part of the period of Judges. Because uh, David's grandfather was born at the end of the book. So it's within a couple generations. So the book of Ruth is written about events that took place toward the end of the time of the Judges, but it was written, that when, the, when it was written was during David's reign or perhaps uh, not long after that. All right. So in the case of the Gospel of John, the events covered in the Gospel, the story takes place during Jesus's earthly ministry. Right. It starts um, sometime after the baptism, probably right after Jesus comes out of the wilderness in John one and then goes all the way until uh, post-resurrection appearance in John 21. So we're talking, you know, three or four year period there. Um, that the story takes place in. However, the book was not written in that time. It was written later. Okay. Question is when? When was it written? Well, if it was written by one of the disciples, and it was the disciple whom Jesus loved, so we know it would be within the lifetime of that disciple. So it was definitely written uh, within, you know, 40 or 50 maybe even 60 years um, from the events within the book. Okay, we know that for sure because it was written by one of the disciples. Uh, but but when, when was it likely written then uh, in that period? Was it written like soon after the events in the book or was it written uh, 20 years after or or much later? And so knowing that John was the author and church history tells us that he lived until he was, um, you know, in his 90s, probably lived almost to the end of the of the first century. Um, we have to determine, well, what when might the book have been written? Um, and more importantly, what was going on in that time? What was the occasion for it being written? I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So historical context of the author, that is when the story was written, when the book was written, can be determined since we know it is John. Um, it's likely written sometime in the late uh, mid to late first century. Now, here's where at times uh, we do need to rely on the early church fathers. Um, Irenaeus, again, remember, he was the disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. Uh, indicated the gospel was written uh, much later than the first three, while John was on Patmos. And again, remember, he wrote Revelation on the island of Patmos. And by the way, I've got a picture here. I visited Patmos. Um, this is the picture of the cave where supposedly John had received the revelation, the visions of the Revelation. Obviously, I was, there was other tourists in there, so, you know, not, uh, but... I did want to at least uh, 
show you. I have another picture of the island. I forgot to post it. But uh, we weren't supposed to take pictures in here. So that's why I had to do it one real quick. So I pulled my phone out, took a picture, and then put it away so I wouldn't get in trouble. But because uh, um, there's actually a church uh, meets in here. It's an Orthodox, Greek Orthodox church that uh, that meets here. But any case, this doesn't matter for your background context. I just thought it was interesting. But there is... Um, reference to John's exile in the early church fathers that it took place toward the end of Domitian's reign, uh, just before Domitian died in the late 90s. Um, so the book was likely written early to mid 90s in the first century. All right, so it came much later. We, we know that the other gospels were likely written around mid 50s to mid 60s. So this gospel is some something like 30 years after the first three, written 30 years after the first three. So an important question would be, why? Why did John write this gospel? We're going to come back to that when we talk about the occasion. I want you to think about that because I'm going to ask you guys for some input in a minute on that. But again, this is, we have to remember Every book of the Bible was written um, under the inspiration of the Spirit by a human author. Written at a specific time, specific place, for a specific reason, to a specific audience. And so we always want to be thinking about what, what was it that motivated the author to, to write. So... But before we get to that, let's consider a few other elements here. The geographical context. Here's what I would put. Uh, several locations, right, are mentioned throughout the book, right? It's a big book, as we've said. But I just picked out the most prominent ones that were mentioned. And then uh, for our story in John 4, of course, we're going to want to know about Samaria. So when we study the story, I'll get more details about the geographical context. Where was Samaria? What do we know about Samaria? Um, some more of these locations you can cover in greater detail when you, when you um, study that particular portion. But for this assignment, just identify the places, uh, the prominent places that you see. And then the cultural context. Again, I just wrote a few notes. Story takes place in Israel under the rule of the Romans. Um, it's led spiritually by the Sanhedrin. And then I should have put a few references here to show that. So these are the culture in which the story takes place. And then finally, here I want to come back to this, the occasion. All right, so again, relying on the early church fathers, but there's also, there's a couple other details I think that would tell us um, this was written later on, is that, but one, we, we learned that uh, early church fathers indicate that it was written or in, in John's time on Patmos, probably during, uh, you know, when he was there under the reign of Domitian, which uh, took place from mid mid eighties to the to the mid nineties. And what's interesting, I'm going to ask you guys to read. There's a as you look at, you know, as we look at the epistles and study them. Uh, right. There's mentioned many times of false teachers, false teaching. Right. Uh, many of the epistles make reference to to false doctrines going around. And if you study the epistles kind of in a general sense, the earlier epistles, like like from Paul, there's a focus on there's we can see there were many attacks on the work of Christ. Right. Paul is often talking about, you know, not relying on the law. Right. It's it's faith that justifies faith in Christ, not the law and how there were Judaizers going around saying, yeah, believe in Jesus, but you also need to keep the law. And so there was a real attack on the work of Christ. But what's interesting is in John's letters, we see mentioned there of attacks on the person of Christ. There's still issues with the work of Christ, but also there seem to be um, 
there were references by John about false teaching in regards to the person of Christ, his identity, who he was. We see this in a few examples here. Let me pull this up. Um, Stephen, let me ask you to read. Uh, this is 1 John 2, 22 to 24. Could you read that for us? Who is the lion? The one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. And the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Okay. So we see here kind of this reference of denying Jesus as the Christ. Uh, and even denying him as the son. But then he's more explicit a little later in 1 John 4. Uh, Brother Sonny, uh, could you read this passage, 1 John 4, verses 1 to 3? Brother Sonny, if you're available. Okay, sir. Beloved, do not, be, do, not, do not believe every spirit, but test every spirit to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out of this world. By this, you know that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus is the Christ, is Christ. Jesus Christ has come in flesh, is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now it is already in the world. Great. Notice he says, many false prophets have gone out in the world. So he's talking here, the context is false teaching. And what is it that they were likely spreading? Well, notice he says, Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. So here, just uh, confessing that the Son of God became a man. All right. So there apparently were attacks by the false prophets, false teachers, attacks on the person of Christ, that he had not come in the flesh. And so one way to, to test the, the accuracy, the correct theology of, of a person was, did they believe Jesus had come in the flesh? And then in 2 John 7, he mentions deceivers gone out in the world. They do not acknowledge Jesus as coming in the flesh. Okay? And he even calls them, he even calls them, uh, you know, the spirit of Antichrist. And so uh, here we see just elements, hints at the fact that Later on in the first century, there was attacks being made against the identity of Christ. And so I, I think these imply, uh, maybe even a little bit explicit, they indicate that, um, you know, the false teaching had expanded. Now, it was not just the work of Christ under attack, but also his identity his deity and his humanity. They were rejecting that Jesus had come in the flesh. They were rejecting that he was the Messiah, rejecting that he was the son. And so here seems to be, again, the theological context in which the author John lives. And now if, if he's writing this book towards the end of the first century, we're talking now about another generation, right? This would be, at least, you know, 60 years after the resurrection. So I want you to think about that. Think about, you know, none of us, or, or you know, most of us weren't even alive 60 years ago. Those of us who were, were pretty young. And so think about it, this is a whole new generation in the church now. It's a whole new generation of people in the world. And so there seems to be at this time now more attacks on the person of Christ, not just his work. 
So as we think about this, remember, how does John begin his gospel? Right? What does he focus on as he begins his gospel? Does he start with, uh, you know, the, uh, like in Matthew, you know, the birth of Christ? Does he start like in Luke with even the conception of John the Baptist, the conception of Christ? Or Mark, who sort of jumps right into uh, the beginning of Jesus's earthly ministry? Um, he doesn't begin that way at all how does john begin right you remember these famous words right in the beginning was the word the words with god the word was god he was in the beginning with god all things came into being through him right there's and he keeps going through uh how john was a witness testify about the light that, again jesus is the light the light of the world coming in the world and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we see here in the first 18 verses, the focus of the book as it begins is on who Jesus is. It was a deep theological statement of the person of Christ. Right? What, what greater, uh, more, more profound statement to begin the book with? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Wow, that's a lot there. And then he continues to go on describing him as Jesus as creator, as the light, uh, describing him as the grace of God revealed, describing him as a word who became flesh. All of these things focused on the identity of Christ, the person of Christ, but in a theological treatment, not a narrative treatment for the most part. See, so I think, why did he begin the book that way? This is supposed to be a, story of jesus's ministry it's a narrative about his ministry why is he beginning with this theological statement on the identity of jesus so understanding the historical historically the situation and even theologically what was going on when john like wrote this this book Do you see the connection there? Do you see why John then may have focused his attention on the person of Christ, knowing what the false teaching was that was going around in his day, attacking the person of Christ? So we can see there's an intentional focus on rightly understanding who Jesus is. In addressing, as he addresses the the false teachings going on around him, and uh, Yancey read earlier that passage from John twenty, verses thirty and thirty one, which uh, give the purpose of the book. We can go there again. Right? And he mentions the many signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples that he wrote about those signs. Not all the signs, not all the miracles, but these have been written. The ones I wrote to you, John says, I wrote these so that you may believe Jesus is what? The Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, and God's Son. Both man, the man, and God. All right? And so he begins his book with that very statement. Jesus the, was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And in verse 14, the word became flesh. And as you go through the book, we see this over and over and over. The author keeps pointing to Jesus as the Christ and Jesus as the Son of God so that the reader would believe. So he would know correctly who Jesus is and as a result, believe in the right Jesus. I mean, I, I'm I'm reminded of, is it John 8? Um, when the deity of Christ was under attack, 
where was it? Was it 24? Yeah. Um, said to you, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Um, right? He's referencing here, I believe, his deity and that if they, if they reject who Jesus is, then they will die in their sins. So John wants to make sure that the reader knows exactly who Jesus is and believes in the right Jesus because there were false teachers going around trying to say, no, Jesus did not come in the flesh. The son of God did not come down and be a man. What are you kidding me? John says, no, he did. And so he writes his gospel to reveal the works of Christ, the signs of Christ that point to him as both Messiah and Son of God. Okay, now, the other Gospels, of course, revealed that. They revealed Christ's deity and his humanity. But John had a particular focus and emphasis on that to address. Remember, he's writing to another generation of people. He's writing in a theological context that has changed a little bit. Satan has moved the attack not just on the person, the work of Christ, but also against the person of Christ. And by the way, this was this was a challenge in the early church for the next uh, two and a half centuries, three centuries, trying to understand who Jesus is. So if you look at the look at the councils, the Council of Nicaea, Constantinople, Chalcedon, those early councils and the creeds that came out of them, the statements that came out of them, it was all focused really on, it was focused on the Trinity, but particularly on who Jesus is. Like the Nicene, Nicene Creed or the Nicene Constantinople Creed is really 90% about the Son. The other 10% is the Father and the Spirit. Why is that? Right, because that these attacks regarding the person of Christ only continued even beyond uh, John's day into the second and third and even fourth centuries. So I think it's important we understand what, what was the context, what was going on, what, what, what was being taught and spread in the days of John later in the first century. And that is what prompted him to write this gospel. That was the occasion to write this gospel. The three other gospels covered the events in Christ's life and his death and resurrection. There wasn't any need to write another one to clarify any of that, right? Those were sufficient. <laughs> the synoptics were sufficient to clearly demonstrate who Jesus was. But John, remember, remember these books, we're back to this principle. It's not just historical narrative, it's theological, it's historical theology. There's a, a theological intent behind these books, not just to tell us the events that in Jesus' life, but to present theological truths about Christ to their, firstly, to their original audiences. And so John, recognizing these attacks, um, this false teaching, this false doctrine, these false prophets who were going out deceiving, and what was one of the things that they were deceiving about? Who Jesus is. And so he writes a gospel to, again, yes, go back and look at events in Christ's life, but he's using those as a polemic, uh, as a proof of the identity of Christ so that they would believe in the right Jesus. And that believing they would have eternal life. Okay, so there's there's definitely a, a motivation by John to write this gospel to address a theological issue. So it's not just another book of events of Jesus' life, you know. It wasn't like John was saying, well, gee. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they forgot. They didn't write about the water turning to wine or laughs. They missed a bunch of important events. So I need to write a gospel to fix 
what they missed. No, that's that's not it's not what John was doing. Or it wasn't like Matthew and Mark and Luke were inadequate or they insufficient. No, those were completely they each fulfilled the intent that each author had for those gospels. But John wanted to write a gospel, including particular events or signs that pointed to the identity of Christ so that there could be no doubt. So it could be perfectly clear and explicit. Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. You have to believe in that Jesus if you're to have life in his name. And so if you look at story after story through the gospel, they keep pointing back to that. Keep pointing back to identifying who Jesus is and the importance of faith. And really the book is laid out. We're going to see that in a moment here, how the book is structured. And it's really focused on genuine faith versus unbelief. And how people respond to Jesus. As both an encouragement, what it looks like to believe, but also a warning of the power of unbelief. And so um, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so here I've given you quite a bit. You can use this for your, as you do the assignment on the background context, um, for the book. So, you know, you can send me some pesos later for, you know, giving you all this help on your, on your assignments. Um, but, you know, hey, I just, I'm just here to, to help you brothers, all right? Um, here's the actual assignment, 2.18, background context. I give you an example from another gospel, the Gospel of Luke. I put quite a bit of detail in here, just to give you an idea. This is all the example from Luke. And then I give you space to do for, for the Gospel of John, just following the same format, okay? And then uh, the key question is, and this is what the background context is intended to point to, is the occasion for the book. So I just spent a little bit of time talking to you about that, what the occasion of this gospel, what prompted John to write it, because um, that's what's important. And that will be helpful for us as we understand the occasion, what prompted the writing of the book. That then helps give us an understanding of what the purpose or the focus or theme of the book is. And again, that is mentioned explicitly, John chapter 20. For the, um, as we move to the next step, really is to focus uh, on the what we call the contextual flow or the literary context of the book. And that's essentially, remember, the author's flow of thought. So this is for the next assignment, assignment 2.19, the contextual flow of the book. And really, it's just the idea of, of identifying and summarizing each story in the book what you need to do here for the epistles the author's flow of thought the contextual flow i had you summarize each paragraph in the epistle because each paragraph was a unit of thought as you look at a larger narrative you're not going to be doing that but you do still want to try to have an understanding of what is the flow of thought and in a narrative that flow of thought is presented through each of the stories and so for this assignment all i'm asking you to do is identify those stories and then just sort of do a quick summary of them. And here, I'll, I'll show you. Again, I'm being very, very generous to you guys today uh, here. This is what I'm I'm asking you to, to put, all right? I just identified each of the stories um, in the book. So John 1, which we covered in class, by the way, as an example, was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Then there's the wedding at Cana, the cleansing of the temple, Nicodemus, John's testimony about Jesus in John 3, the woman at the well, and then the healing in Cana. All right? And then that was really chapters 1 to 4 were really sort of the presentation of Christ and focuses on belief. But then after that, there's an emphasis on unbelief, the nature of unbelief from chapters 5 to 12 through the various accounts there. And then when we get to chapter 13, John moves his focus towards the disciples specifically. 
in John 13 to 17, and then he ends with the crucifixion and resurrection in the last four chapters. Okay, but here basically I've identified each story in the book. And now as we as we're going to move our attention um, next week to to the John chapter four uh, particular story, it's helpful to have this general idea of the flow of the book and the stories because you want to see how does the story I'm studying fit into this. And again, remember, we uh, discussed this in class. I think it's in your appendix in the syllabus. I talked about the larger structure of a book. Okay, right, where there's, there is um, in each book sort of a, there's a, there's a structure to it. And in the longer books, the bigger books, you'll have sections. Uh, even in the epistles, like Romans, there's two major sections in Romans, right? One through 11, that focuses on the gospel. And then 12 to 16, that focuses on the response to the gospel. Ephesians, same kind of bigger structure, chapters one to three gives attention on what God has done in Christ for our salvation. Chapters four to six, he talks about, focuses on how we are to respond to what God has done in Christ. Hebrews, there's two major sections in the book. Chapters one through the middle of chapter 10 focuses on Jesus as the great high priest, as superior um, to everything else. And then chapter middle of 10 to the end focuses on, again, how then should we respond to that truth? All right, so we see this kind of structure in every book, you know, where there's a larger structure. And it's especially true in the narratives. And so in the Gospel of John, I've, I've sort of put, put that uh, for you here. Okay, where I've identified each of the stories in the book. And then really, as you look at these stories, you can see a larger structure. From the introduction, in those first 18 verses, where he gives a theological statement of Jesus, who Jesus is, to sort of the early, these early stories focus attention on really the first two signs that Jesus performs. Or that John, sorry, uses as pointers to who Jesus is. And then the focus here is on the nature of, of genuine faith. Okay, but then as you study the stories from chapter 5 to 12, you notice there, there's a lot of opposition. We don't see that opposition really in the first four chapters, but we do see it in 5 to 12. And really, I think John there is, is giving to us what unbelief looks like. Okay, he's not just telling us stories about, you know, in the enemies of Jesus. Okay. Certainly that's, we see them there. But I think the point he's trying to make is to show the power of unbelief. And, and all those interactions Jesus has with the Pharisees and Jewish leaders and people who choose to, to not believe him. Like all of the, all that he provides all that he does all that he says they still reject that so i think john is showing in those stories that focuses on the nature of unbelief okay so we can kind of see a larger structure as you go through and so what we want to do is uh so for your assignment on the literary context sorry the or the contextual flow let me pull it up for you here assignment where is it here it is. Okay, um, this is the assignment 2.19, the contextual flow of John. I give you an example from Luke. All right, every story in Luke, and then the larger sections. Okay, um, and then identifying the purpose of the book, how your story fits with what's before and after, and then I give you I give, and then an outline. This is an outline. Just go to a commentary, or I use the MacArthur Study Bible, but you can copy an outline there. So this is where I'm actually allowing for you to, to copy, copyright. Um, it's just find a, an outline from another source. But you need to come up with an outline of all the stories, a uh, summary of each story. Identify and then summarize each story in a short sentence. 
which I've actually guys done for you because I'm so nice. I did it for you, but still want you to, to look at yourself and then just uh, summarize each story in your own words. Don't directly copy me, but at least I gave you a, a format there to consider. And then I want you to identify the author's purpose of the book, which I also already told you, John 20, verses 30 and 31. So Luke did, uh, gives his purpose in the beginning of the book. John gives it at the end. And then what I want you to do is you are assigned a passage. So you may be assigned John chapter 2 or, or something from John, um, was it chapter 5, I think, or John 6. Um, I assign passages from those. So you just need to indicate how does your specific story that you have connect to what's before and after. So, for example, uh, we'll see this when we go through the, the gospel of, uh, sorry, the John chapter 4. Um, where is it here? Okay, John chapter 4, the woman at the well. So when we go through that example, uh, here we just want to, at this step, step three, you just want to mention, okay, the woman at the well, this story takes place in the, really the, the first major section of the book where John focuses on belief. And in that section, it's found between the first sign, the wedding at Cana, and the second sign that John mentions, the healing in Cana. How do I know that's the first and second sign? Because that's what John says explicitly in the book. So we have John 1. If you remember, we covered in class when Jesus, um, John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the disciples, early disciples kind of believe. And then three days after that, Jesus is up in Cana at a wedding. Of course, we know this miracle. He turns water to wine. Some of you guys have this as your assigned passage. And notice in verse 11, John says, this beginning of his signs, Jesus did. Okay, so here, remember, the purpose of the gospel is to present signs that Jesus did that show he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, so that we will believe. And notice here, his disciples believed in him. So we see the elements here, the sign, the first sign, and the disciples believe. So that's in wedding at Cana. Then if we go to the end of chapter four, after the woman at the well, notice it says there at the end, after he's with the Samaritans, he goes back into Galilee. He heals a nobleman's son. And then look at what it says at the end of that. This is a second sign Jesus performed when he came out of Judea into Galilee. And actually, by the way, he's in Cana. So John, this is how we can know this is a specific uh, larger section because he brackets it with those statements. The first sign and the second sign, both happening in Galilee, in Cana. Between those, we have these events, which include the woman at the well. And we'll come back to that later when we study this story and I'll help you to see the significance of this. But at this step for contextual flow, you just need to identify the story, summarize it, and then note um, the larger section there if you can. And again, I've already sort of given you the answer here for that. But um, um, that's what, we, what I want you to do for this particular assignment. All right. Okay. Well, I've done a lot of talking myself here. Uh, so after you indicate how your passage fits with what comes before and what comes after the story before and after, then just write down an outline from another resource on the book, okay? All right. I've talked a lot here. Questions, comments, thoughts? Um, anybody have anything? So far, you can really look at this as a uh, sort of uh, just giving you some significant hints for your first three assignments for John's gospel. But I want to try to help you along 
um, with your assignments. So this maybe help you be able to finish this these first three a little bit quicker. But I wanted to go through it because it sets a foundation for as we as we're going to look at John chapter four and that specific story. We need to have an understanding of the book overall and the flow of the author's flow of thought, how that story fits within that that flow is very, very important. OK, you have to know, as I talk to you guys in class, until you can answer the question how does this story connect to what came before how does it connect to what to the story that comes after it and how does it connect to the purpose of the book you have to be able to answer those three questions before you rightly understand the story right because narratives in scripture aren't a bunch of random stories just thrown into a book like you know in an anthology you know, an anthology is, right? It's just a collection of short stories that don't relate to each other in a book. But that's not the case in books of scripture. These narratives are a collection of stories, events that are that the author presents that are connected together in some way in order to communicate his theological message and purpose of the book. And so the author, in this case, John, has specifically chosen these stories. He specifically chosen the events, the dialogue, and what's in each of these stories. And he specifically chosen the order of these stories in his book in order to communicate and and give us and, and show us the teach us the purpose of the book, which we already know. He told us explicitly. I'm writing these signs so that um, right, you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you have life in his name. That's why I'm writing this gospel. That's why I've written this book. And so these stories in the book are going to come together in such a way as to, as to show us to reinforce that purpose. And they're going to be connected together. And so you need to be able to understand this overall flow of thought in the book and the structure of the book so that you know how your story fits, how your passage fits in that. Okay? Thoughts or questions? Okay, well, what I'd like to do is uh, for today, just uh, have us read uh, the story of the woman at the well in John 4. We're just going to have uh, ask a few of you guys to, to read it. We'll just read through it this morning. Uh, and then, Lord willing, next week when we come together, we'll start the process of studying, going through the steps and studying that story uh, looking at the setting, you know, and the scenes and characters, etc. Go through that story just as another example from the Gospel of John. Um, uh, you know, and, and that'll help you with with your assignments uh, that, that you have regarding your passage. But what I'd like to do is just for this morning, we'll just end our time by reading through the story, kind of reminding ourselves of it. And the next time we'll we'll really um focus our attention on studying it, okay? Unless there's any questions before that. Okay. Well, let me pull up John 4, and then I'll ask it. I'm going to ask a few of you guys to, to read it. Um, we'll come back to setting next, next week. Okay. If I could get, uh, Chrysler, if you could read verses 1 to 6, and then Nigel, Nigel, if you can take verses 7 to 11. Fantastic. Okay, Godwin, uh, 12 to 16. Uh, Yancey, 17 to 22. Stephen, 23 to 26. And then I'll, we'll see from there. But uh, if you forget, I'll just call on you. So, Chrysler, if you could do one to six, start us off. 
Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave his to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Okay, there Nigel. Came a... Sorry, Sorry seven. go ahead. There, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Verse 12, you are not greater than our father, Jacob. Are you who gave us the well and drank it for himself and his sons and his cattle? 13, Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. 16. He said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. Um, verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming. When neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. All right. Sonny, can you read verses 27 to 32? All right. Thank you. At this point, at this point, his disciple came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you what what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me at all the things that I have done. This is not. The Christ is it. They went out of the city and were coming to him. Through uh, 32. Uh, 30, okay. 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to, to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Great. Thank you. Uh, Brother Lendon, can you read 33 to 38 here? Sure. 
your microphone working, brother? Can't hear you. No one goes into the earth. The food is to do yeah. the will of him and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on fields that they are wide for harvest. Already this week is receiving wages and is gathering food for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together, may rejoice together. For in this cause the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored, others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Great, thank you. I'll finish up. From that city, city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the savior of the world. Okay, again, I know it's a familiar story. Just wanted to read it. Uh, next week, we'll start looking at this in more detail, doing the narrative analysis, go through the story. Again, just as an example, how you're going to approach your particular story from John. So next week, we'll start with the setting. We'll read the story again and then make observations uh, together and then look at the setting of the story. And then uh, followed by following week of uh, scenes doing the scene analysis and character and plot okay and eventually you know identifying the exegetical idea the homiletical idea so kind of covering those key steps uh, with you going through this example together and then of course in the midst of all that if you guys have any specific questions uh, about assignments or even about your passage i'd be happy to to uh, help you out so that's why you know be working on these assignments so that as you're doing it, if a question comes, you know, you uh, want to use this time as well to address those questions you have. Um, so I want to help you on your, your specific passages also if, if you want to um, take advantage of that. Okay, but we'll, we'll stop here uh, for, for this morning and just uh, give one more chance for anybody if they have any comments or questions uh, before we close our time together go ahead yeah pastor tim yes sir what do you think is the purpose of john to in presenting jesus always saying my art has not yet come if his purpose is to reveal his deity is it some sort of a contrast or to highlight the greatest revelation on the on his passion because it's repeated in the whole gospel that my hour has not yet come my hour has not yet come and then yeah it seems like it's contradicting the the desire of john or the desire of the author to reveal him or to witness about him yeah that's a good question because you see at other times like in john 4 where jesus directly says i'm the messiah Right. That's what he told the woman at the well. And then even the the people say, we came to believe that you're the savior of the world. Uh, John, right. In John one, John the Baptist says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Uh, John eight, Jesus said, you have to believe that I am or you will die in your sins. And so there there are on the other side, many direct statements by Jesus and others as to who he is. So I think the hour has not yet come. It's more the idea of, you know. The whole aim is towards Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, right? That's the final evidence that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so I, I think there's more of this. Um, we'd have to look at the context of each of those statements. But I believe the general idea is just the um, 
as John sort of keeps putting those little statements in along the way to emphasize, you know, we're, we're coming towards the main event that's going to reveal without question that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And that's going to be his death and resurrection. So, but all the way through that hour, that point in time has not yet arrived. Um, uh, I, I think is the general idea in him making those statements. But, but there's not, you know, John's very explicit all the way through about Jesus directly identifying himself or others directly identifying him openly um, regarding his identity. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a good, that's a good question, considering as you go through the gospel. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Thank you. Good. Any others? Any other comments? Pastor Tim, you did mention earlier that uh, the way John, or even the way John ordered his gospel was intentional, right? Because I, I love the summary you made. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the pre presentation, particularly right now, and there are four key stories there, right? At least, um, yeah, between the first and second signs. Uh, uh, yeah, the wedding at Cana, the cleansing of the temple, the Nicodemus, and then John the Baptist's testimony, five rather, and then the woman at the well. So um, as we do all these narrative analysis, it would become clearer even as to why John ordered uh, the stories in that fashion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as you go through the details of each story, and studying it on its own, you know, giving specific attention and better understanding. This is just sort of a general summary, uh, you know, before you actually dive into the details of each story and go through the narrative analysis for each story. When you do that, it's going to reveal more. So as you go through and you get to, to John 4, you've already, you know, studied in detail the stories before it. So you can at least see how this sort of follows and then we have a general idea as we look to like i said we can see the marker here and i highlighted it in green just to help us see it more clearly that there is a you know these stories in the sandwich between the first and second sign i think are connected together in some way especially nicodemus his interaction with Nicodemus and his interaction with the woman at the well, because there's some clear parallels between those two accounts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's more of a, at the, the initial stage, you're just trying to get familiar in a general sense with the flow of the book. And then as you examine each story in more detail, hopefully then you we're asking, the thing is, Nigel, we're, we're asking ourselves the question all the time. Why did the, why did John write the story? Why did he put it here? Okay. So if you're thinking this way, like what are the connections? You're going to be looking mm -hmm. more for that. But if you treat every story as an independent account with its own focus, and you're going to miss that connection. Okay. And yeah, you're right, Stephen. Some outline the book based on the seven signs. Um, or the seven I am statements. Uh, that's more to me. It's harder to see that structurally. It, that's more of a thematic approach. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that as you look at the stories surrounding those, um, that it's that it's that clear. And those, because uh, I don't think you can make, group them together. Let me say it that way um as clearly as i think the approach i made yeah i think there's you know the number seven and the seven signs the seven ims i think that's intentional um for sure whether or not we can say that john intended that to be the way he structured his book i'm not so convinced as i am with with more that that uh, this idea of the focus on faith nature of belief and unbelief and then even just following the, because the stories in those sections, you can see how they're connected together a little better, I think. 
a little bit of subjectivity here, I'll admit. But uh, yeah, as you're going through the gospel, you definitely don't want to miss the seven I am statements. And then the seven signs, we do see how the first section is framed by first two, you know, sign one and sign two, so to speak. Um, so we, we clearly John's using those signs as markers going through the book because he's pointing to his final purpose statement in John 20, verse 30. But, um, Sonny, sorry. You had a question or comment? Hi. Yes, sir. Um, I observed actually uh, throughout the book, um, uh, John uses some sort of dualistic literary style, like, for example, uh, darkness and light, yeah. uh, above and below, um, you know, like heaven and uh, 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 food and water, something, and all of those dual literary style. How would that uh, help us also uh, understand our passage or the entire purpose of the book? Yeah, another great question. Um, you do catch, there are, you know, John's gospel, you know, people, scholars sort of put John down as like this uneducated, you know, his grammar simplistic, the guy, but honestly, his, his, his gospel is very sophisticated, uh, very well written. There's a clear flow. He's very clear. He's focused. And then you have, yeah, the seven signs, the seven I am's. Another thing, John interweaves like these contrasts, like you said, yeah, light and darkness, um, eternal life, eternal death. You know, there's these that he's he weaves throughout. You just want to pick up on those. Another thing is the word sent. This idea of Jesus being sent. He mentions that quite often throughout the gospel. So there's some other key ideas or themes that are woven within the gospel that you want to pay attention to because he comes back to those quite often. So you just, you need to just take note of that as you hit those sections and recognize um, when those things take place and that this, he, he uses it to reinforce particular themes going through the book. But all of this, all of it is meant to ultimately point to and reinforce the overall purpose that the reader would come to believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and believing you with life in his name. That's what John wants us. He says explicitly, this is what I want you to understand from this book. So we got to be careful that as we find these other uh, repeated ideas or other literary devices that he uses, that we don't that that we don't make those override his main purpose in the book. They really should support it in some way. So you have to think about how are these connected to what John's wanting to accomplish in the book as a whole. So does that make sense? Yes. And also, sir, um, I also observed that um, the word believe on the mm -hmm. believe in faith has been repeated throughout the book and yes. it has been used both for those who are chosen by God and also uh to 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 those who are you know believing Jesus but not not really not really true believers something like that so yes yeah there's a and that's why I said that uh, the idea of the nature of belief and unbelief because yeah in John 6 he's got there's disciples following him that seem to believe but yet when we get to the end of that chapter they walk away so whatever they profess with their mouth is faith John clearly shows that genuine faith is demonstrated by a commitment to follow Christ no matter what. And so, yeah, that's a good observation. You want to be careful that he, the word believe or faith, uh, pistis or pistuo, you know, the derivations are all through the book. It's obviously a major theme because it supports his main purpose. But John wants to be clear what true faith looks like versus false faith or unbelief. Just one more thing, uh, sir. Yeah, sure. No uh, in the context of, uh, of ch chapter four, which is the theme of Christ as the living water, uh, um, he previously in chapter three there is a discussion between between Nicodemus and Jesus. Jesus, who's uh, the, the 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 point of that discussion is about regeneration, like born again and all of sort of yeah uh, that that kind of 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 
uh, topic there. And um, uh, I don't know if I'm right with regards to the, the theology here, but it seems like um, John or Jesus or John pointing us to the reality that 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 regeneration precedes faith because you know before John three sixteen there is John one to fifteen where where there's a discussions between uh, Nicodemus and, and Jesus um, about the the re, about the reality of regeneration uh, that that precedes faith. Yeah. I don't know if I'm correct or if I don't know if I've been. Yeah, what, what do you think, sir? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we're getting into the Ordo Salutis now, and Order of Salvation, and that's the that's the we have an expression in the U.S. We call that the deep end of the pool, right? You know, swimming pools have a shallow end, like one meter deep, and then they get deeper, like three meters deep. So uh, theologically, this is the deep end of the pool. Um, but just briefly, yeah, John six even draws this out as well, right? Jesus says, uh, "You do not believe because my Father." has not essentially chosen you, he's not drawn you. Uh, so this idea of the importance of a regeneration necessary for belief. But that's a there there are several challenges with with that that we have to also consider as far as how does how does the God's activity and man's responsibility um how do those work together? Because you, you still, you can read the whole Gospel of John and it'll be clear, yes, God's role in, in election and regeneration, but at the same time, man's responsibility to believe. And we cannot deny either one of those as necessary for salvation. How they work together, which is kind of what you're drawing upon here as we look at John 3, as we'll look later at John 6, Um even a little bit in John 4, though the living water there, I think, is clearly identified in John 7. And we'll cover that when we go through the story. Um, so, yeah, I think many things John mentions here would sort of lend themselves to support that idea in the Order of Salutis. But we have to be careful because, you know, when you're looking at theological truths, we have to incorporate all that Scripture says on a particular uh, topic and so um but even i think john 6 is probably the best chapter to look at as far as how faith and how god's work in our salvation and how how faith and man's responsibility how those kind of work together because john kind of mentions them interchangeably in a sense um but i'm going to leave it there because this we could end up in a long, deep discussion on this, but I think it is something that, yeah, John, like I said, John is a very skillful writer, really, and he's woven in some pretty significant and deep theological um, truths within the book. And uh, it has much to say about not only the doctrine of Christ, but even as Sonny pointed out, the doctrine of soteriology, there's a lot there that we can learn about that. And even, even in John 4 that we just read, um, you know, genuine worship, true worship. He gives one of the most direct statements on worship in the New Testament. Um, so that's very instructive. So there's a lot there to take in, but it's good questions. But it's afternoon time, so I want to give you guys, uh, I can hear some stomachs rumbling. So uh, I want to let you guys go for lunch as well. But these are great questions. Thanks, guys, for uh, for these uh, questions and insights. Really helpful. Hey, let me ask uh, Brother Nigel to close our time in prayer, if you don't mind. All right.